Welcome to the Property Renovation Podcast. For anyone who loves renovation, wants to save money, and to learn the best tips and tricks of the industry. And now, your host, three times award winner of leading renovation website, House, and over 15 years in the industry, renovating just over 200 properties, James Woodham. So, Tim, welcome to the Property Renovation Podcast. Um, thank you for taking the time out to come on. Um, and uh, I, I thought it would be a good idea because we wanted to get uh, a perspective from a charcoal surveyor um, on the show and um, just so that uh, homeowners can benefit from this. So I think we'll just kick off, really. We've got a few questions for you. Um, and, sure. And uh, I think let's start off with, um, if, can you give us a brief background um, of your career and how did you start, how did you become a charter surveyor? Okay, well, it probably goes back into um, probably genes. Um, my father's an architect, my uncle's a quantity surveyor, uh, my brother's a, a structural engineer, and my sister was a chartered uh, civil engineer, so we're um, got buildings in the blood, I suppose. Um, I, I suppose I fell into building um, as my dad was um, you know, building and renovating houses, and he was um, developing as well as um, designing. And uh, I was always interested in building. I um, started doing a degree in building up at uh, Polytechnic of Central London. And I was commuting up and down from Folkestone every day. And it was a bit of a pain because it was the old slow train. And uh, one day I just got so bored with it all. Um, and I, my dad said to me, look, why don't you get yourself a job and then get trained you know, whilst you're learning on the job? And I saw this... Um, uh, advert for a trainee building control surveyor at uh, Shetway Council and uh, so I went back to dad and said uh, yeah, what's, what's one of those in dad and he said well basically son, if you get in there you won't do any work and they'll train you up so I thought well, that sounds like perfect for me um, so I, I, I applied and I got the job and then they trained me up um, to become a, um, a, a chartered building engineer um, and surveyor and um, I suppose it's, it stemmed from there. Um, building control, which is really my bread and butter, is really um, very much focused on two areas. It's around um, the aspect of auditing and checking the designs. Um, so you're dealing with you know, structural calcs, thermal calcs, you know, engineering, fire engineering, and general design issues. Um, and then that's mixed with a sort of presence on site where you're out looking at the work the builders are doing um, and, you know, making sure it complies with the relevant legislation. So it's a really good mix. And I'm being really um, privileged to effectively have gone from, you know, the assistant building control surveyor all the way through to being chief head of building control, representing the southeast region in building control, etc., um, and now being a you know a consultant, um, you know working for um, various different bodies um, in, in building control and expertise in that area. So yeah, that's really my background and career. It's very extensive, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's a lot that you've you've been up to. I, I mean, um, you just to go back about the family, it's, it's like in the genes. I, I guess the the conversations around the dinner table must be great. Well, it's always a bit, well, you do it that way, no, you don't, you do it this way. And there's always lively discussions about um, what's the best way. And, you know, architects being BAs are, you know, Bachelor of Arts, so they're always arty-farty. And, um, you know, um, whether you look at an engineer, and there's that sort of classic um, um, garden swing, isn't it? The, the, you know, how the architect saw it, how the structural engineer saw it, how the quantity of the see, sees it. I think yeah. everybody has a different slant on, on buildings and what's important to, that, to, to them. And, you know, um, you know, architecture and architects, they have a completely different view and um, a uh, passion, perhaps in a slightly different way to me, that I have more of an engineering and a passion for um, correctness and getting things right. Yeah. Would you say that you have like a, um, challenges in your in your industry or on a daily basis? Or, or oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the challenges are very very much because you know the construction industry. Yeah, you know, a builder doesn't need any qualifications. You just need to you know, a wheelbarrow and a you know a, a white van, and that's it. He's off. Um, so you, you do get. Uh, a lot of different um, problems because people just don't understand the way that things are built and the reasons for it. And lots of these things are um, almost, 
you know, hereditary. They've 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 worked through trial and error. You know, why do we have a cavity wall rather than solid walls? Well, because in the UK we get a lot of driving rain, and and solid walls, you know, create dampness, and you know, hence why we have damp proof courses, and why damp proof courses need to be above the levels and linked to damp proof membranes. It's all about the climate that we're in, and we learn from our mistakes, and that's one of the biggest things is about, you know. When you're putting a, 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 you know, building a new house, for instance, you're putting together, what, 40, 50, 60,000 different elements, all the tiles, the bits of timber, etc. So, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable why things aren't necessarily exactly right all the time. But what you should be doing is learning from every time and thinking, well, actually, that didn't work particularly well that way. Why don't I do it this way this time? So, you know, an experienced builder will have learned over the years what the issues are, what are the problems, and how to overcome them. And part of the role of building control is it's about education. It's about trying to, um, you know, tell builders and, um, and homeowners and architects, look, you know, the reason you need this is because of that, 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 and that. It's not just because the book says, it's because there is a reason uh, and a basis for the legislation to um, require certain standards. So it's all sort of links back to, you know, if you want to go right back to 1212, you know, the, you know, the first you know, Great Fire of London. Um, obviously, the 1666 one was, is, is one that more people are aware of. Um, so you could argue that they didn't learn a lot in the 400 years between the two. But that's the first start of it where we were looking about fire spread between properties. Mm. So, you know, it's, up, it, it's, it's there for a reason. It's not just there to, you know, create a hurdle. It's there... Because if there is a you know, sound justified um, problem that it's actually tackling, and it's all learned from from experience in past um, episodes of, of what's what's happened. So yeah, I, I mean you know the the, the um, Glenfield Tower. I mean that's just a classic one where you you know there's going to be some major changes to legislation because of that failure. Now we should learn from that, and we will no doubt have stiffer and tighter regulations over cladding and uh, compartmentation and fire stopping, yeah. etc. All of that will come into play, no doubt, in over the next few years. But we should learn from literally every single time we do a job, what went well, what, what, what can we do better next time? And yeah. I think that's what many people don't sort of, or builders don't tend to take on that ethos, which is around getting it better every time. Do you think the, the everyday homeowner, do you think that they consider enough um, when they're just about to do a project like this? Like, no, it's, all, it's, no. All, it's always last minute. We want it done yesterday and we want it done for next to nothing. And, and that's, that's a problem because if you want to do something this, I mean, you are spending a lawful lot of money on the biggest asset that you probably own. So why don't you take time to think about it, get it designed properly, get everything in place, you know, and ensure that what you're doing, one, that you're happy with, two, it's what you're after, three, it's within your budget, and four, it's to the quality that you're after. You know, those are sort of the fundamentals that people just say, no, no, I want this extension built yeah, yesterday. Well, if you do, you're going to pay for it somewhere along the lines in terms of either price or quality because, you know, there's just not enough investment in the design, in the supervision, um, in the, the thought process in bringing designs together. It's just that investment up front is just not there really and people need to learn from that. Take your time, get it right, you know, and then build it, make sure it's built right and enjoy it afterwards. A few fair points there. Okay. Mm. Um, let's talk about, um, so let's just say, the standard homeowner that's just, uh, thinking about doing an extension, let's say a four metre by a six metre extension at the back of their house, could you just talk through the processes that they would have to go through right from the beginning? Okay, well, planning is around the control of development and it's about saying that um, you can build certain size extensions um, out to the back of uh, and side of properties within what is called permitted development rights. Now, the problem is that the rules change continuously and there are lots of little if, buts, what. What, what if this, if that? 
for instance, obviously, if it's listed, that's a problem. If, if it's a, a adjoining a, a highway, that's another problem. Um, there could be Article 4 directions on, which means that the you know, permission uh, may be required because the, you have no permitted development rights. So it's always advisable when you are looking to build an extension that you apply for what we call certificate of lawful development from the local planning authority, saying, look, I, this is what I want to build. Does it formally not need consent? So you're applying for them to tell you it doesn't need consent. And then they will give you a certificate of lawful development, i.e. it's okay. The danger is that people crack on and think, oh, it's, a, it's permitted development because it's only three metres out or you know, four metres out or six metres out, depending on the circumstances, which is fine. You know, that, that may well be the case. But I've often found that people, when they come to sell the property, all of a sudden it's, oh, can you, can we get something from the local authority to say, is planning permission, you know, planning permission wasn't required? And then you find out, actually, planning permission was, was required. And then you're into the stressful part of getting a certificate of lawful development for something that's been built for, you know, four years. Are they going to, um, uh, agree it? Are they not going to agree it? Are they going to refuse it? So there's lots of stress around these things, and it generally happens when you're going to move, and that's not necessarily the most, uh, you know, best time for for this sort of thing to to rear its head. So it's always wise to apply for a certificate for lawful development, and it then gives you that certainty that planning permission is not required. Now remember that there are two consents. Planning permission is about building the extension, the size, the impact on the environment, the impact on neighbours, its setting, etc. And then there's building rates, which is about literally the nuts and bolts, the technical way that the extension is put together. Building rates doesn't it doesn't care how it looks in terms of colour, style. It's about how it's put together. So there's some really important issues there because some people think, oh, I don't need planning. That's it. That's you know, I don't need any consents. Um, that's another misconception. Yeah. And like, so, it, it, oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it, it, no, permitted development. You know, don't just assume is 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 my um, so, you know, is my advice. Never assume it's permitted development. Always ask. Always get the confirmation. I mean, I did one very recently um, in uh, in Hive uh, down in Kent, where literally it was infilling a um, a doorway and a window to the front elevation. And I applied for a certificate of lawful development because that's what I always do is give my clients the protection. Mm. Um, and when we applied, I got a, a call back from the planning officer to say, no, it needs permission because in our interpretation, the frontage of the building steps back into the door recess and then back out again. And therefore, you are building in front of the line of the front elevation. A very weird interpretation, but you can see the problems that happen if you just make some assumptions. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, can you talk a little bit about um, the refusal that a homeowner might get um, after something is built? What, what's usually the process? What's the worst case? Well, the worst case scenario, if it, in terms of planning, is effectively that you know that you are served with an enforcement notice for to remove the development. Um, you know that's the extreme that could happen. Um, it may be the fact that you may have to modify the extension. Um, you know, maybe in terms of height, it may be in terms of overlooking. Um, but the majority of the time, it all stems from neighbour complaints or complaints from a local resident. Right. where they're aware of something going on and, um, you know, that generally rears its head at that stage. So, you know, at that time, it can become extremely stressful for the owner thinking, oh, I've just paid, you know, thousands of pounds to have this built. You know, are they going to knock it down now? Are they going to make me knock it down? So, you know, it's, very, it's worthwhile taking time, get the necessary consents, get the permissions, or whether you need consent or not, before you actually start to proceed. Okay, good. Um, the standard approach of like a, a homeowner uh, hiring a building company is usually they, they do a little bit of research online, um, then they select a company, um, and they will go and get a couple of references. But that's about mm -hmm. it. Um, and then they hire them. So 
Um, personally, I don't think that's enough. So what would you say? Well, I always, I always say to people, you should always get three quotes. The reason I say three quotes is that you never know what, you know, whether one is high. If you get two, one is high, one is low. You could get two quotes of both low, uh, you know, and, and in reality, the person in building it can't build it for that. Where does that leave you when they're halfway through the build and they say, sorry, the money's run out? Um, so the idea of three quotes is to basically qualify that you, your choice of, um, builder is based on that, that quoting process. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to choose the cheapest or the most expensive or the middle one. It basically allows you to make a more, you know, in better informed judgment as to what you're getting. Now, the other mistake that quite a lot of people do is they don't ask the builders all the same questions or don't give them all the same information. So one builder thinks, oh, I'm doing the decoration or I'm doing the wall tiles or I'm doing everything. And the other one thinks, oh, I'm, I'm just doing a plastered shell. Um, therefore, I'm not going to quote for that. Or that I didn't include that in there. Oh, I didn't include this. Oh, I didn't include that. So it's always preferable to have a detailed specification um, a detailed schedule of work that you want the builder to do and make sure that you give that same schedule, the same information to every one of the three builders that you are asked to quote. Otherwise, they will just be quoting you. Be, you know, it's a bit like apples and pears. They're not going to be doing the same thing. Do you think homeowners are, are quite open to, if they don't have that kind of data, the specs and the, the schedules and stuff like that, do, are they, they're open to risk in a way because people can be on site and they don't want to, you know, they've done something that then they have to charge for but it wasn't approved. Yeah, that, I mean, you know, totally. I mean, it is quite a, a, a common trick that builders turn around, give you a price, and the price is, I don't know, let's just take, make some figures up, but just say £50,000, and that's that's where you thought it was going to be, okay, £50,000. Then down down the line, you know, it, it, it starts to become, oh, well, actually, um, you know, we didn't include for a, you know, a fiberglass roof. We were just going to put a three-layer built-up felt roof. Oh, that's another, you know, £500. Oh, we didn't realize you wanted downlight as we were just going to put a central single pendant in. Oh, you know, and it starts to creep in terms of the extras because there's miscommunication between what you think you're going to get and what the builder thinks he's delivering. That, to a certain extent, is probably the hardest bit of communication um, that's about, is about trying to, um, you know, if your expectations as a client it may be higher or generally will be higher than the builder's um, expectations or, or even ability to deliver. Um, and that's where you've got to at some stage, you know, think actually if I'm getting a bargain basement job, are they actually really going to deliver me a, a Rolls Royce service? Well, no, they're not. You know, it, you, you, you get what you pay for. I guess you just don't want to be in that situation as a homeowner. If you have, you're half, you're halfway through the job, you're really like thinking, okay, this is going to end soon. And then the, the, the price does start to creep up with the extras. You're kind of up against the wall, really. And you don't really well, have precisely. any choice. No, you have no choice. And the builders know that. They know that, you know, okay, we'll walk off the job. You know, if, if you can't, if, if you, you're not willing to go for the extras, we'll walk off the job. We won't, you know, you won't have a roof on your, your building. You know, they really do make, um, you know, are able to, to, you know, command, um, quite a lot of control. That's why to a certain extent, it really comes back to the contract that you have with the builder rather than just being a lump sum bang, you know, that's what it is. And, you know, it's almost to the point of, you know, do you pay any money up front? Do you not pay any money up front, etc.? You know, most builders tend to work on, you know, have a, a reasonable credit rating. Um, most builders will be VAT registered. So if you've got one that's not VAT registered, um, you know, you can start thinking, well, actually, his turnover can't be that good. Is he really big enough to actually do, do my property? Um, so you've got to think very hard about the payments and you've got to think, you know, really the payments should be only for what you've got on site 
Now, that could be physical bills or materials on site. That's all you should be paying until to the point where you've he's finished and you then should still have a retention, which you can then hold if there's any issues that come up, you know, whether it's for a period of time, three, six, nine months, whatever you agree in your contract. But it is all about managing uh, that process to ensure that the build can go as smoothly as possible, right from design all the way through to construction and then completion, and even at the end, to make sure you know, when there's an evaluation that you're happy with what's there. I think it's a good point. You mentioned about the retention. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Like, what's a, tip, what's, a fair, what's a fair retention to hold? Well, a fair retention would probably, I would say, is about 5%, and, you know, I would tend to hold it for what I would consider to be a period of... Um, you know, of um, time that you would, where you expect defects to come to light. So, for instance, if you had, uh, you know, a five percent and you had it, only kept it for a month, it didn't rain for a month, um, then you, you, you know, paid the retention over, and then it rained and the roof started leaking. You, you know, you really haven't really, really captured what it's about. The retention is is, a, is effectively a way of holding some money back. Uh, on the uh, builder to ensure the quality and to ensure what he's done is right and to make sure that he rectifies any defects. Now, that period, as I said, I would almost always go for six months. Um, some people go for a year. That could be a bit excessive. But again, it's got to be specified in the contract at the beginning so the builder knows that. He knows that he's not going to get 5% of that contract sum until six months or 12 months after he's finished. Okay, good. Um, I think it's a fair point to say now that we're not, when we say builders in general, we're not meaning all building companies that, that, uh, that, that are bad. Uh, it's just that there are... A, a no, I think the trouble is the, the, the building industry has a bad reputation with mm. with uh, with lots of people. And that's why I say, and, and until you can become a registered builder, I mean, theoretically, I'm, I'm a chartered builder. I'm a member of the Chartered Institute of Builders, so I'm a chartered builder. I wouldn't profess to be a builder. I, I am a you know, that's I'm not a phys, you don't do any physical work. Um, I know lots about it, and I, well, I have actually done some physical work when I was a, a, a student. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very complicated process. And to a certain extent, you know, people can just say, get a, get a wheelbarrow, a white van, I'm off, I'm, I'm a builder. You know, yeah. It takes a bit more than that. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, there are building companies out there that do have the passion and they do take some time and invest in accreditations mm. and, um, so that they want to be seen as trustworthy and know what they're doing. Yeah, oh, totally. And even single one man bands, you know, they are very good and they take a lot of pride in what they're doing. Mm. And it's, it's not about, um, I suppose the, the best way to describe it is, um, I went onto a site, uh, where there was a major house builder this week. Um, and the block work, which was below ground level, was very messy and extremely looked very tatty. It looked awful. Structurally, it was okay, but it looked awful. It looked all, some of the joints weren't filled. It just looked awful. I went on to another site where um, I'm doing some uh, supervision for um, a client, and this builder there, he is pointing the block work below ground level, and he says, I like to do it because I like to have it looking neat and tidy. Now, that's a difference in my yeah, mind between somebody who has pride in the job and is willing to say it's properly done rather than somebody who says, that'll do. That, that's the difference between them. Yeah, that, that is the difference. Yeah. And it's just so hard to, to – I think they get overshadowed, the good, the good builders. Really. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And a good builder, you, you know, he will be busy because his reputation will yeah. be very good. Um, you know, and you know, therefore he probably his prices may be higher, but that sort of goes back to this issue. He probably won't be the cheapest, and he probably will have a much better uh, reputation around. Um, you know, it's almost to the point if you're going to look at references for builders, what did he quote you? What did you end up paying? You know, those are sort of some fundamental questions. Oh, he quoted me fifty, but I ended up paying seventy. 
you know, what, where did the 20,000 come from? Well, if there was something, you know, oh, I asked him to put a new kitchen and then that was 19,000 pounds, well, you know, there's your answer. But, you know, if there was no additions to the build during the process, why did it work out more expensive? Very good point as well. Mm. Uh, okay, um, something fun here. So if you, were l- if you were lucky enough that you could build both up and outwards, um, mm-hmm. so you, you should only choose one. What would you choose and why? Me, I, it would depend. I, if, it, if I was in a, a, a rural setting, it would be outwards because I think the idea of space and ground floor, I don't like stairs to that extent. But if I was in an urban area, I would build up because I think I do love views across roof spaces. Um, so I think, you know, depends. I, I like both. Okay. All right. Nice, fast and quick. Okay, um, could you just talk a little bit about minimum standards for building control and versus the quality? I think we've touched on it a little bit here. Yeah, it, it's a misconception that, that people think that um, you know building control acts as a clerk of works for for the for the applicant. It doesn't. It basically building control is about the local authority or building control body enforcing the minimum standards of construction for health and safety purposes for people in and around buildings, for the conservation of fuel and power and contamination and misuse of water. It is not about how it looks. It is not about quality in terms of the build quality. So there's lots of things that um, comply with the building regulations, but you wouldn't want it. I mean, you know, for instance, you know, um, if the mortar joints were a different thickness, so you had perhaps a 10 mil joint and then a 15 mil joint and then a 5 mil joint, providing it structurally was okay, it would meet the building regulations, but it would look awful. So there's lots of things that can comply with building regulations, but is poor workmanship, could be poor um, build quality, um, but because they meet the minimum standards for health and safety, i.e., you know, the structure will stand up, it might not look very good, then it's fine. And people really struggle with that concept that building control is not about quality. It is about just enforcing minimum standards. And that's okay. very much misunderstood by lots of people. Well, hopefully listening to this, we'll understand a little bit more now. Okay, um... Can you give us an example of a project that you've managed and worked that was done to a poor standard and talk a little bit about that? Okay, well, luckily, uh, I haven't been involved in too many. Um, I, mean, I have <laughs> not, 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 not the whole lot. I, I always try to think that if, if there's something that's going on that's a poor standard, then to a certain extent, I've perhaps failed in my job, but also to a certain extent in terms of if it was for building control, those other people have failed as well, because it's about trying to get things right from the start. Um, I think I suppose one of the worst ones I had was where we had a, um, a loft conversion carried out um, and the builder who uh, built the loft conversion put new floor joists in but he supported the floor joists off of the um, binder now the binder is a timber that crosses the ceiling joists so it's effectively spreading the load so we had the new floor supported onto a binder which was spreading the load back onto the original 4x2 ceiling joists what the builder then did when he put some pipework in, he notched the um, binder, which was a four by two timber. He notched it and took three inches out of it to run some pipework through. So oh effectively, we had we had the whole thing supported on just barely an inch of timber. And I, I ended up eventually having to prosecute this builder uh, because of the, the, the poor workmanship. And the best way I can describe it in the, the magistrate's court um, was, um, you know, the magistrate asked, well, how bad was it, Mr. Parent? And I said, well, um, so it was like trying to justify supporting a bag of sugar on a drinking straw. And you could see that he then realized how bad it actually was. And, um, you know, that's sort of the type of thing which is, is, you know, does happen. 
Luckily, um, because of the publicity of the case, um, you know, the poor homeowner um, who had paid all of the money up front, uh, by the way, um, who was out of pocket and pregnant as well, so just to help it all, um, she ended up with, with some really kind builders coming in and offering to effectively do it at cost to try and rectify the, the, is the issues for her. And um, she ended up with a nice loft conversion, but um, just a shame she didn't get it right in the first place. But uh, there we go. That's what happens to builders. My God. And how, how long was the whole process? Like how, you know? Well, in terms of, you know, well, to actually prosecute the person yeah, all the way yeah, through. Just to go through yeah. all of that. Yeah, it takes months, absolutely months. And, of course, then the issue is, you know, what's happening to the poor homeowner? There's a lot of stress around all of that. And, you know, it, it, it's just not nice, not manageable. You know, your house is your biggest asset. Therefore, you should be protecting it by using, you know, investing in the design, investing in the, you know, the supervision, investing in the project management and investing in the builder. Well, I'm glad it turned out good in the end. Yeah, it did in the end, in the end. In the end. Okay, um, let's talk about one that was just of excellence. Well, I think I've, yeah, I've probably been involved in a lot more of these, you know, thank, <laughs> thankfully. And, and uh, I think the ones I, I, I enjoy most are the ones where you are invited back by the homeowner and the homeowner turns around to you and says, this has exceeded my expectations by miles. I am so pleased with, with what I've got. And when you have that, this sort of, uh, the, the, the accolade that that gives you, you think, actually, this is what I'm in this, this role to do. Because some people can't have that vision about what they want to have. And when you come in, they say, oh, you know, I would like to have this, this. And you go, yes, well, okay, we can, you can have that. Um, and then when it all starts to come together, they see it, and you can see that their their excitement you know, almost builds up to the point that you know you get people. So you know, I've got some you know lifelong friends that have, have been clients because of the you know, the projects that they have been so happy with, um, and that's really what it's after. It's about that that getting things done right and do it right the first time. Yeah, that's really nice. I mean, it, it is. It's like a journey, isn't it? And you become mm. friends. If it, everything goes well, and then you, it's something that you can just look back and be proud of as well. You know? Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, it's yeah. nice to, 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 to drive round places. I think the first house I designed, I did at 18, and it's still standing. I can, I can say that to you. Um, the design wasn't particularly challenging because it was somebody who said, this is what I want. It wasn't necessarily you know, me inputting into the design process. It was very much long, this is what I want. Can you draw me up some technical drawings to make it work? Um, and that, that, to me, that's, I drive past that every day thinking, you know, okay, that's one that I did. It's not the best design in the world, but that's what she wanted, and it's still standing, and it still looks good. A great achievement. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Good. Okay, um, let's think about that. Could you give five tips, perhaps things that we've not discussed so far, um, to a homeowner that's about to do a renovation for the first time? Well, the first thing I would say is take your time. Take your time in deciding what you're going to do. Um, you know, if it's a complete renovation of a property that you're not occupying, that's great because that allows a lot more freedom for the builders and the designers to do things uh, around you. What I would say is I always suggest to people to create a, a folder on an iPad or, or the computer. And if they see something browsing, they think, oh, that's really nice. I like that. Pop it in there because it's the collection of ideas that people have and being able to extract the information that a client has and to be able to put that into a physical build is probably one of the hardest things. So if you can have a client who already has a sort of like a, a scrapbook of what they're after and ideas, that's great. But at the same time, you've got to be realistic. I had a client once who came to me and said, this is what I want. They had a lovely timbered house with lots of trees around it. Um, in actual fact, where it was built was on Dungeness shingle marshes with not a single tree around. And, of course, it just didn't look anything like what they were expecting. And I never would do. So, you know, there, there's got to be some realism into what you're achieving. Budget. 
Be mindful about your budget. Um, also make sure that you have a good contingency uh, allowed for. So where things do crop up, I mean, in terms of renovation, um, you know, you might take some, for instance, wallpaper off the wall and often might come a load of plaster. Now, you've got to plaster the wall back. That's got to be seen as, as, a sort of, as an extra. You know, so you've got to allow a contingency. And I always think if you go for a 10% contingency, then that's really quite, quite good and generous. And I suppose the question is, if you manage to turn up at the end of the job, you don't spend the contingency, then you've deserved a holiday, then the contingency will pay for it. <coughs> that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, in terms of other things, I would say, you, you know, in terms of the quality of the designer, um, you know, you need to be looking at what they uh, have done previously, whether the styles are right for you, what they, you're looking at, what you, 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 you know, the communication. Communication is a massive one within the industry, um, and it's about making sure that everybody understands what they're getting uh, and what is being delivered. Um, and about timings as well. Um, you know, if you've got a deadline, we need to you know that needs to be known. But what happens if that deadline, you know, is exceeded? What what, it, what are the options that you've got? So I think it's all to me. It's all about risk and trying to minimise the risk of anything really going wrong. And to do that, it's all about planning. Some very good tips. Okay. Okay. okay, I don't know whether that was five, but there was someone near. <laughs> I think it was more. I think it was six. Okay, okay. so, um, okay, last thing. So, um, as you know, the Proctor Renovation Podcast is what we've been doing. It's been, I think, now just over a month, um, and we've had some good uh, episodes, and we've got some really good ones coming up. I just wanted to get your opinion on what you think, how you think uh, what we're trying to do. Is, do you think it's a good idea? I, I do. I think I think the issue is it comes around you know, communication again. It, the more advice that you can give people, and the more advice people take on board in dealing with um, renovations and building work, the better. Because a lot of people, you know, it's an exciting thing to do, uh, but at the same time, it's quite scary when you see your you know your house being you know part demolished or you know ripped apart. There's always this fear of, you know, what happens if something goes wrong, etc. Well, the, the whole idea about, um, you know, the podcast and, and the, the information that we're, we're giving out, it's about trying to help people manage the risk, manage the process, and to help them realize their dreams. Because, you know, effectively, the, the house is your home, um, you know, and what you want to do is, be, you know, it to be happy, and you want it to be what you want it to be, um, you know, a nice property. Thank you. I, I, I think we've got a lot of information for people to digest and uh, I think it's been a really, really good episode. Um, Tim, thank you very much for coming on to the Property Innovation Podcast. Uh, You're very welcome, James. All right, thank you very much.